happened to my time of content. Thank you. Um, thank you guys all for coming. Uh, if I asked you guys to name someone who you wanted to emulate, someone who you looked up to as a hero or a mentor or a visionary, my guess would be that most of you would say someone that you've seen on TV, some of you have read books about, you've seen movies about, a Barack Obama figure, a Bill Gates figure, maybe a Mark Zuckerberg figure. But, what? That was yours? Yes. I knew it wrong. <laughs> but how often does someone on your list, is that someone that you really have spoken to in person? Someone that you've shaken their hand, you've asked them for advice, you've come to them, you've called them up. If you ask me, my list of mentors, of someone I look up to. Of course there are people on that list that I've never met before and that I will never meet, but there's one person on that list who I have met, and that's the man you're gonna hear from today. So I'm not really gonna go into his resume too much, I'll let him do that for you, but I just want you to, I think he's gonna talk for about 15 minutes, and then he'll kinda have the open floor and you can ask whatever you want, um, whether it's about politics or religion or whatever it is, he's open to everything. Um, but he's phenomenal. He's gonna, I guarantee, blow your minds away. So just, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Gordon Zacks. How many of you have studied the Holocaust? How many Jews lived in Europe, including the Soviet Union, in 1938? Percentage, not the number. Twelve million. How many Jews were slaughtered? Why were they killed? What was the definition of Jewish? One eighth Jewish blood. It had nothing to do with your behavior. It had nothing to do with how good a person or bad a person, how rich or how poor, anything. They had one eighth or more Jewish blood and destined for being slaughtered. Now, how many Jews lived in the country of Bulgaria in 1938? 500,000? How many? 500,000. 500,000. 48,000. I, I, I kind of... 48,000. How many Jews were left in Bulgaria after the war? 500. 500. Two. Two. Zero. Zero. 48,000 before the war, 50,000 after the war. All of whom were born of natural birth, not immigration. The only country in Europe occupied by Hitler with a Jewish population that increased through natural birth during World War II. Why? I have been impacted by the Holocaust, haunted by the Holocaust, all my life. I have been a student of the Holocaust. I've been involved in Jewish life my entire adult life. I never heard this story. When I read it in a newspaper, I called Ellie Wiesel. And I said, Ellie, is this true? Did this really happen? And he said, yes. I said, then why aren't we studying this, not in Jewish school? But in schools all over the world, something spectacular happened, something heroic happened. What happened and why did it happen and what can we learn in order to improve ourselves and the world? He says, well, it's a very complicated story. I said, were there 48,000 and then 50,000? He said, yes. I said, that's not complicated. I am going to go to Bulgaria and find out what happened for myself. So in order to do that, I made arrangements to go to Israel first, because between the time of Hitler and the time of today, the Soviet Union <coughs> liberated Bulgaria after World War II and occupied it until like 1989. And during that period, something like 35,000 Jews left Bulgaria and went to Israel. So there was a huge Jewish population in Israel. And I went to see the Joint Distribution Committee in Jerusalem and asked them to brief me and prepare me for what it was that happened historically. I went to Yad Vashem. I spoke to the people who understood and were documenting the story of Bulgarian Jews. 
And then I took my wife of 57 years and we went to Bulgaria. And we were met by the country director of Bulgaria, a woman 28 years of age. And she's running the whole JDC program in Bulgaria. She is the daughter of a Holocaust survivor. Her mother, who is Jewish, married a non-Jewish man. So she is Jewish, technically, but her father is not Jewish. She was not raised religiously, but she was raised aware that she was Jewish. I told her what I wanted to do. She says, where do you want to go? I said, I want to go to the old age home first. Because that's where I will find survivors. She says, well, they won't talk to you. I said, why won't they talk to me? She says, I don't know. My mother has never talked to me about what happened during the Holocaust. None of my friends who are Jewish, who have parents who survived, will talk about what happened during that period. I said, well, let's try it anyway. So I went to the old age home, and I knocked on doors, and I went into room. I sat down with these aged survivors of this period, and they told their stories, one after the other after the other. Nobody had ever asked them. And I was really moved. And this young woman was moved to tears, but she hadn't heard these stories. Then we left the old age home, and we went to the Jewish community center where they serve one hot meal a day for the aged and firm who are still mobile in the Jewish world. So the, the whole first floor of this building is probably six times the size of this room. And I went to the back of the room, and we had three round tables put together. And I had invited the non-Jewish people who had rescued the Jews during the Holocaust in Bulgaria to come and tell their stories. So I'm sitting back there, and these people are telling their stories. And all of a sudden, you look in the front of the room, and all the Jews who are there for their one hot meal a day look at the back of the room and wonder what's going on back there. They get up, and they come to the back of the room, and they want to tell their stories. So it's not that nobody will talk. It's that nobody asks anybody to talk. Now, what happened? What's the story? Bulgaria is a country that was founded in the 19th century, one of those artificial Eastern European countries. And the religion of Bulgaria was Bulgarian Orthodoxy. The leader of the Bulgarian Orthodox Church was called a metropolitan, like an archbishop. And the church, for almost a hundred years, had preached tolerance and respect for difference. And Bulgaria had become a place where oppressed peoples went to seek refuge. When the Turks slaughtered a million Armenians, those, Jew, those Armenians who survived fled to Bulgaria. When the gypsies were slaughtered in Romania, gypsies came into Bulgaria, where they were welcome. And the Jews came to what is known today as Bulgaria, primarily from <coughs> the Spanish Inquisition, 1492. They fled and came to what became Bulgaria. Now, the interesting thing is that these people lived together, not in ghettos, but openly, intermixed throughout the community respecting each other's right to be different, and treating each other as equals. Now, in 1937, the king of Bulgaria, a man by the name of Boris, decided there was going to be a war. <laughs> decided to ally himself with Hitler because he thought Hitler was going to win the war. So he enters into an uh, arrangement with Hitler, where they become allies. In exchange for not being a victim, not being invaded, Hitler demanded the following things. Number one, 
have to pass the equivalent of the Nuremberg Laws. Who knows what the Nuremberg Laws were? What were they? There were serious laws basically discriminating against Jews, Armenians, and basically the country around the world. That's not great. That's not great that in a minute. Uh, was the test also to see how Jewish people look according to? They went beyond that. They stripped the Jews of all their human rights. They had no human rights. They had no legal rights. They couldn't cross the main streets. They couldn't be in the business. They couldn't go to college. They couldn't do on and on and on. <clears throat> that law passed. There was no rebellion. There was very little protest, except for a few newspapers that protested against it. The second thing that Hitler wanted, he gave as a gift to Bulgaria the uh, uh, countries of Thrace and Macedonia. In Thrace and Macedonia, there were 14,386 Jews. Hitler demanded that 20,000 Jews from Bulgaria, in exchange for this arrangement, as part of it, be transferred to Theresienstadt. <coughs> The 14,386 Jews in Macedonia and Thrace were transferred. There were no demonstrations. There were no protests. How many of them do you think survived the war? How many? 12. 12 people. Now, then Hitler wanted the difference between 14,386 and 20,000. And he demanded that it come from the Jewish population of Bulgaria. Now there's resistance. And the non-Jewish people of Bulgaria said no. They are our brothers and sisters. They are natural citizens of Bulgaria. You cannot harm them. You cannot have them. Different than Macedonian Thrace. No historical connection. So the king had to back off. He created forced labor camps. Everybody in the male population, 16 years and older, up to 60, had to work nine months a year in these camps under horrible conditions, a lot of malaria, a lot of sickness, but nobody died in these camps. They were ill-fed, they were ill-clothed, and they had no medicine. How did they survive? Mr. and Mrs. Bulgarian peasant, at the risk of their personal lives and that of their family, brought food, clothing, medicine to these camps and kept these Jews alive. Time passes, the war is shifting. Hitler decides to rupture the relationship with Bulgaria and occupies Bulgaria. Now the Nazis are in charge. And the Nazis are directing the king to accept the responsibility to terminate all Jews who live in Bulgaria. So he passes an order, he, the king, in the middle of the night that First, the difference, 7,000, 6,000, or whatever the difference was between 14 and 20,000, those Jews had to be deported right away. Now, half the Jewish population, 24,000 Jews, lived in the city of Sofia. The rest of them lived in other places throughout Bulgaria, but the second largest city was a city called Plovdo. They had about 10,000 Jews. In the middle of the night, Jews that had to be rounded up to be sent to Theresienstadt on the order of the king were rounded up in Sofia, put into a major park in the city of the city, and they were rounded up in Plovdov and sent to the Jewish day school in the center of the city that also had a railroad siding attached to it. All of this is done in the middle of the night. Why? so that Mr. and Mrs. Bulgaria aren't aware of it. 
and will demonstrate and protest against them. <coughs> to build a barbed wire fence, <coughs> create this temporary holding pen, and then in the morning, early morning, the Metropolitan in Sofia, Stefan, is awakened by the Jewish leadership of Sofia to say what is going on. He says, we will go to see the king. It's 5 o'clock in the morning. His office is five blocks from the king's palace. They walk down. The king is ill, unable to see them. He won't leave. Stefan says, we will stay here until we see the king. Finally, the king agreed to see them. And he said to the king, <coughs> King Boris, I lifted the crown from your father's head when he abdicated. I put the crown on your head when you succeeded as king. If you don't rescind this order, I will personally come here and remove the crown from your head. Now that's chutzpah unadulterated puts. Now, he says, furthermore, Boris says, I mean, the, <coughs> Stefan says to Boris, there is a judge higher than you. And as you judge these people who are our brothers and sisters, you will be judged for an eternity. So be careful that you don't contend yourself to hell. Now that takes guts. To say that to a king who can cut your head off in a minute. And then he turns around and he leaves. He goes back to his office. The phone's ringing. His secretary answers the phone. It's the king. The king would like to talk to you, Metropolitan. Metropolitan says to his secretary, tell the king, I do not speak to Calvin. Now, is that character? Is that courage? Is that leadership? Simultaneously, in the city of Plovdov, the metropolitan of Plovdov was a man by the name of Kirill. Kirill is awakened at about the same time, taken to the school where this railroad siding is existing, and the train is there to deport these Jews to Theresa Stein. He goes to find the commandant of the camp. One's a Bulgarian, the other's a Nazi. And he says to both of them, you have no right to harm these people. They are Bulgarian citizens. And if you try to put them on that train and deport them from this country to Theresienstadt, I and my followers, listen to this, We'll lay our bodies across the railroad track in front of the engine, and you will have to run over us to get these people out of here. Now, that's a lot of what's going Just ask yourself a question. How many of you, for a stranger, would be willing to follow Curiel and lay your body out on top of that railroad track to prevent strangers that you do not know personally? from being taken by train to their death. Raise your hand. How many of you do that? How many of you were in the train ready to be deported would hope somebody else would be willing to do that for you? Raise your hand. Everyone. And the message really is, I mean, if you want somebody else to help you, you got to be willing to help somebody else. Now, what happened is Boris rescinded that order. And not a single Jew from Bulgaria proper was deported to Theresienstadt or died as a result of the Holocaust. Directly, indirectly, many people. And Elie Wiesel summarizes the lesson of the Holocaust saying indifference to evil is evil. 
indifference to evil is evil. The Bulgarian story sends a clear message. Resistance to evil is good. And if you have the character to know right from wrong, and you have the courage to act upon it, and if you have leadership that will stand up and hope you understand what the nature of the challenges are facing you and the other people that are with you, you have a chance to improve the world. And to hit evil and strike it down. Now, when I met with these survivors and I met with those who rescued, I asked them, rescuers. Why did you do what you did? And they didn't <coughs> literally understand the question. Not because of the language barrier, because I had an interpreter. But they said, we, we just did what anybody would do. There are six million graves because it's not what just anybody would do. And six million Jews are dead because they didn't do it. And Bulgaria and Denmark are two examples of what can happen when evil runs the world and strong people of character resist it and stand up to it. The world can be a different place if you have those qualities and you have the guts to use them and to fight evil wherever and wherever you see it. And I think that story is so powerful that it ought to be taught in every school in the world. To teach people the lesson of the power of one. What one person can do if they're willing to put themselves on the line for what they believe in. And act with character and with courage. And that's really the lesson that I want to share with you tonight. That's one of the stories that's in my book. Most of the people in the book you might know Many of them you won't know. But the book, Defining Moments, Stories of Character, Courage, and Leadership, is a series of vignettes about people who had those qualities and made the world a better place. And I'm really here because I think the world needs more leaders with character, courage, and conviction, and leadership. And I'm trying to help strengthen the cadre in the Jewish community stronger than it was. And you're part of tomorrow. A key part of tomorrow. And I'm here to help you in forming your course and your path to become the very best you can become as a human being and as a Jewish leader. And with that, I'm willing to take any questions that you may have on anything related to what I talked about and we didn't talk about. I said thank you for the great speech. Uh, thank you for getting the APAC off the ground. If not, I would not be an APAC cadre member. And I want to hear the story about you, how you met the Rebbe. How many of you want to hear the story about the Rebbe? Raise your hand. <laughs> I, can I can tell you that what the Chabad rabbi said, if you want to eat here next week, you'll want to hear the story this week. <laughs> Okay, the year, the year is 1969. How many of you know what the federations are? Jewish federations. Okay, it's the central address in the Jewish community for planning and organizing the activities of the Jewish community. They meet once a year in a thing called a general assembly, where all the leaders come together to share best practices and discuss issues common concern. So this particular year, 1969, the General Assembly was in Boston, Massachusetts. I was chairman of the Young Leadership Cabinet of the National United Jewish People. And in that capacity, I was asked to give the keynote address, the title of which was, Youth Looks at the Future. So I deliver this address. Conclusion is in two sentences. My father and my grandfather's generation did a great human service to 
the world and to the Jews when they supported the right of Israel to exist, and then they brought people around the world to live in peace and dignity in Israel, as they fought six wars. And I said, we saved millions of people through the affirmation of Jewish values. I am my brother's. But I said, right now, in 1969, I think I could say it today, we run the risk of losing more Jews through assimilation than we save through affirmation in the preceding period of time. And so what's the remedy? I said, improve the quality of Jewish education for everybody. And secondly, make it affordable for everybody. Have a birthright for every Jew to have a quality Jewish education at a school of their parents choosing, with no one denied access because they can't afford it. Parents should pay what they can afford, and the community should pay the difference. So that was the program. So then the question is, what do you do with them when you get them? Give them the same lousy Jewish education I got, you're going to turn off more than you're going to turn on. I said, we don't know how to do it right. And I said, what we need to do is create a venture capital fund for innovation in Jewish education. And it needs to have a 10-year life, so we don't look at things quarter by quarter or year by year. Give ourselves 10 years in which to evaluate what works and what doesn't. And let people with ideas come and apply for grants, which we will make people and ideas that we think make sense. And run a risk of failure, because none of these things are going to be guaranteed to succeed. But if something works, and we find a path that will enable us to improve and make affordable quality Jewish education, we can change the Jewish world. So I proposed, this was in 1969, that we create a $100 million foundation that would have a 10-year life be funded with people who would lend their State of Israel bonds to the foundation, and the income would be used to fund programs. That was the idea. I make this speech in November of 1969, and I get a call in December from somebody I didn't know. He tells me the Rebbe would like you to come on such and such a day in January and meet and I didn't know who the brother was in 1969. But the invitation was so commanding, I felt I was going to see a king. And uh, so I said yes, without knowing who I was going to see. Then I called my rabbi, I said, should I do this? He said, absolutely. <laughs> so I went to see the rabbi. And, uh, and, and there was a a rabbi who had called me, who invited me to go to his home before going to the Rebbe's home. At 11.30 at night, I get a call that I should come to the Rebbe's home in his office and meet with the Rebbe. Now this was 11.30 at night. This was a weekday. This was like a Wednesday. There are at least 300 people literally 300 people waiting to see the Rebbe from all over the world for advice. So I'm ushered in ahead of all of them, which didn't make them too happy. <laughs> and I go in to see the Rebbe. Now, when you see that picture, it doesn't do justice to this man. I walked into a room half the size of this room, with books, floor to ceiling, one light hanging from the ceiling. And this man, <coughs> at that time, had the absolutely clear blue eyes. And he had skin that hadn't wrinkled, it was just smooth skin. And I walk into the presence of this man and you feel like you're in the presence of a saint. And he looks at me, and he doesn't say hello, welcome. He said the following, Mr. Zacks, I've read your speech. You 
it's clear you're taking good care of your brain. <laughs> I can look at you and it's clear you're taking good care of your body. What are you doing for your soul, Mr. Sachs? And that was the beginning of an hour and a half conversation, which is recorded in the book, in which this man, who had grown up and never wanted to be the rugby, he was, he was a scientist, he was at the Sorbonne in Paris, the rugby died, they wanted him to be, he said no, and no, and no, and finally they, they got him to say But not because he wanted to do it, because he felt he had to. So, conversation was intended for one purpose, this is Alex. The Jewish house is on fire. We, the Lubavitch, are the fire department. We know how to put out fires. We know how to build Jewish families that work and function. Our children are not involved with drugs and with intermarriage and with all kinds of bad premarital activities. And he said, we have a path that works. Give us the hundred million dollars. We know what to do with it. You don't have to do innovation. I said, uh, Rebbe, what if we've lost your telephone? He said, God will provide. I said, look, there are a whole host of people out there like me, good Jews, who are not prepared to make the sacrifice and lifestyle that's required to be large. But they're entitled to live a quality Jewish life and find another path. And they need to find knowledge that enables them to do it. And they're entitled to an opportunity. And that's what we're trying to do with this. So we go through this whole conversation, and I'll, I'll get to the, the, the middle of it. You can read it in the book if you're interested. <coughs> He finally says to me, after he, he, and I, he and I are gone for over an hour, and he says to me, Mr. Zacks, do you know the story of Zorba the Greek? Look where I am. I mean, I'm in the study of the Rebbe, and he's asking me about a Greek story, a Greek play called Zorba the Greek. Among all the things that he's reading, he has read Zorba the Greek. He says, do you remember when the young student is asked by Zorba, the spirit of Greek enthusiasm for life, Zorba says to the young student, after having a lot of wine, song, and dance, and he's sitting, he's reflecting, and he says, what? is the purpose of life. The student says, I don't know. Zorba says, then what's the purpose of your damn books? If they don't tell you that, what good are they? And so the student thumps me around and he doesn't have a real response. And finally, the Rebbe said, you, Mr. Zacks, are like a student. He said, wise men and grocers can never cut the cord and be free. I said, wise men and grocers can never cut the cord and be free. You want to find God, you'll never find God through your head. You'll find God through your heart. If you live in a Jewish way, you will discover the significance of God. And that will inform your choices, and that will change your attitude, and that will change who you are as a person. But it will start from here and go here. It won't start here. Okay. And he says, wise men and grocers can never cut the cord because they won't let the <coughs> go. And he says, you're trying to find God in the lecture. You won't do it. So at the end, he says, let me send someone 
to live with you for a year to teach you how to be Jewish. And I said, I can't do that. <laughs> I can't do that. And we went on, and he finally said to me, think about it. <laughs> when I walked out of there after an hour and a half, I did not do what he wanted me to do. That man changed my life in an hour and a half. And my respect and admiration for him as a human being is enormous. And at the end, while I wouldn't and I couldn't do what he wanted, I continued to get deeper and deeper into Jewish education to a degree that I would never have thought of that before. Fifteen years later, my daughter, who lived at that time in Israel, lives there now, finds out that the Rebbe is giving out tzedakah dollars. She's visiting New York. I'm there. She says to me, Dad, let's go get a tzedakah dollar from the Rebbe. And I said, fine, we'll go. Now, I didn't call anybody to get any special treatment. I stood in line like everybody else, for an hour. When I come up the steps into the Rebbe's study, he gives my daughter the Sadaka dollar, and then he looks at me and he says, what are you doing for Jewish education? <laughs> Fifteen years ago. <laughs> no advance notice. I just walk in and boom. And I look at him and I say, you are amazing. He says, how does that help a single Jew? What are you doing for Jewish education? <laughs> and I'm still trying to figure it out because the truth is that I couldn't do it his way. But I've been struggling to find another way. And I continue to struggle with it. And I'm indebted to the Rebbe for the challenge that he kept sending to me. Every two or three years, I get a letter from him. <laughs> what are you doing for Jewish <laughs> Give up this political stuff. Get out of Federation. Come with me. <laughs> I'm still here. <laughs> but I'm in Chabad. And I'm in Chabad with great affection for the Rebbe and for what Chabad does. Next. Yes, Joshua. How do we cultivate leadership within ourselves? I'll tell you my theory. I've spent a great deal of time trying to answer that question. I have answers. I don't have the answer. But first, we have to define what leadership is. And can you teach it? One of the greatest authorities on leadership is a guy named Warren Bennis from UCLA, and I went to see him in California, and I asked him a question to ask him. And he says to me, I'm not sure leadership can be taught, but I'm sure that leadership can be caught. That's a very profound statement, because he said, you learn leadership by leading and making mistakes and having a mentor and a coach from whom and with whom you can learn the lessons of your errors and grow and become more effective. But you don't get it by reading a book. I believe, having tried to understand this, I'm not saying I do, but the pattern that I'm following today is I believe <coughs> leadership is in our DNA like I believe athletic talent, like I believe intelligence, like I believe musical talent, the ability to give to write, the gift to talk, all of these gifts that come from someone, I call him God, makes it possible for me to do certain things. I will never, ever play tennis as well as Roger Federer, but I can become the best that I can be. I can take the talent, however limited, in that arena that I have, and I can, by playing tennis, get better, have a coach improve, and in time, 
develop my latent unfulfilled potential. So I believe everybody has some amount of leadership. However much you have, you cannot get any more. At the same time, I don't believe any of us utilize to the fullest <coughs> the, lift, the gift of leadership that God gave us. So we all have undeveloped potential, which we can realize by doing what I said. Lead, fail, get a coach, learn, grow, and do it again. And that's my path. Yes, sir. Oh, no, I don't have a question. I don't have a question. Well, you don't have a question. You're just waiting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's another question. Uh, actually. Uh, okay. Okay. My name is Ralph. Right. Oh, I'm oh, gone. Okay. okay. Um, what you said about, you know, trying to figure out the best way to almost like, you know, teach the leadership and um, trying to figure out the best way to maintain our religion. I was thinking about that and I thought about how, like, you know, birthright is what works. Where everyone goes to birthright, you know, once, and then a lot of them go on like the secondary kind of thing. I'm wondering if maybe the, one of the solutions to that is instead of letting, you know, like you said, mentorship is the way to teach, the mentors be maybe even just one generation beyond the ones who are now learning because they it's all fresh in their mind. I don't think there's wrong that. I don't think there's any wrong. My 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 attitude is you're not gonna like what they're thinking. <laughs> My attitude is the value of an idea is zero. An idea plus implementation, the value is infinite. So don't tell me about it. Go do it. Okay. <laughs> and try it and see if it works. And if it works, do it and replicate it. But nobody knows that that can or can't work better than a cocker who's my age trying to mentor you. Until you try it, you don't know. So begin with the premise that if you've got the idea, if you believe in it, go do it. <laughs> well, I was just uh, there's a quote by someone on like Gandhi or Dalai Lama says something that to exert influence you have to also be susceptible or take influence from everything around you. How would you agree with that? Like how to implement that? There's a I was asked to do a TEDx conference at Claremont College. I'm going to refer you to Gordon Zach's Claremont TEDx College. And I gave an 18 minute talk on precisely that question. And the, the, the framework of it was how in the type of world we live in, constant change, pace of change accelerating, how, how do we manage through life? How do you guys manage through your lives? Because whatever the hell I've gone through, you're going to go through more in terms of pace of change and the amount of change than I went through. I went through a lot. And the answers that I gave were three. But you've got to listen to the whole McGill. The first thing I said is humility. Unless you can say, <clears throat> in this complex world, I don't know. And honestly, understand you don't and be willing to seek somebody who knows more than you about that and go and listen and ask and follow, you'll never get off the dime. So you need humility, you need the inner strength to be able to say, I don't know, what do you think, and listen. The second thing you need in this world, <coughs> you don't need a plan. I've talked to you about this before. You don't need plans. You need planning. Because the, work, the assumptions you make in a plan are obsolete before you finish the plan. So what you need is planning the verb. Constantly updating, refreshing, reassessing, redetermining what the shape of the world really is becoming. And then you need to be nimble, adaptable, and flexible. And responding. And uh, in my business, we used to make footwear in our own factory. In order to keep factories busy, you had to produce in the off-season for inventory to be sold when you're busy. You had to forecast what people were going to buy. At one time, we were very good at that. But they were terrible. It's impossible. We'd be broke if we were doing business that way. We got out of all the factories. We contract out other people. 
and we don't try to anticipate what you will buy. We track what you do buy, and we respond quickly. So you gotta be nimble and responsive and quickly move to market. <laughs> and thirdly, in all of that change, how do you keep your head screwed on straight? We need stability, which comes from inner core values that give a framework for you making choices in life and give direction and purpose to your life. And that doesn't change. The Ten Commandments don't change. The whole world around you can change, but you need stability inside. But stability, together with adaptability, together with humility, and you got a formula for living and succeeding in the coming age. Yes, sir, baby. I have a question. Was there something in your life that sparked you to take this initiative to be so pro-Israel, Jewish education, as such? Yes. Um, <clears throat> being born in America, 1933, the year Hitler came to power. Jewish, to parents who were American born. And we didn't have any money. We were very modest. We never went hungry, but we had a very modest Jewish home. <clears throat> but everything that's happened in my life happens because I was fortunate enough not to be born in Europe. Because my uncle came in 1904. And that made it possible for et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm here. And without that happening, I would not be around to tell the story. Secondly, I was old enough to know what was going on in the Holocaust. I was old enough to know that we had no leadership in America that did a damn thing about it that was effective. And a few people running around knocking on doors, but there were no demonstrations, no protests, no major impactful anything. And I know, because I've been a student of it, that we had unused quota to the extent of 50% of the quota that we had available, we could have brought in Jews from Europe. We turned the St. Louis ship around. I never forgot that. I was angry about it. And then the state of Israel was recreated by the United Nations in 1948, and that's the second defining moment of my life. I said, that's the most important thing that's going to happen in my lifetime. I want to be a part of the rebirth of the land and the redemption of the people. How I did it was a whole different story. But that's what I, and that's been the driving force of my life. What do you feel about what's going on right now? Like, the past couple weeks with all these missiles being launched, and it's not anywhere on our media. It's only in, in Jewish media, all the 400 missiles that were launched this past week. First, the world is not fair. Second of all, the media in America is not fair. Third of all, thank God there is an Israel. Thank God there is an APAC, neither of which existed in 1939 through 1945 in the world. And in, in, in these 75 missiles that were fired, 50 of them were down by the uh, anti-missile Iron Dome. Iron Dome. Yes. Developed by whom? Israel and America. In joint collaboration and cooperation. So I wish the media were more sympathetic and friendly. I'm glad that Israel is strong. Strong enough to defend itself. And I'll deal with the consequences of Israel saying, no, you cannot go from Turkey to Gaza and bring weapons and bring people who want to kill us. And the world condemned us. But they stopped them. And I'd rather have the world say, Gavalt, the Jews die. Golda Meir once told me, she and I were very, very friendly. And she said to me, I must ask her a question. I said, Golda, when, when will there be peace? She said two things. She said, when Arab mothers 
love their children more than they hate ours. Then you will have a chance for peace. And then I asked her, I said, how do we how do we get the rest of the world to feel more favorably towards us? And she said, the price of their love is too dear. They love us as a victim. They can't tolerate us as a victor. I'm not willing to pay their price. I'll live without it. Something interesting that goes along with this. Right before I came here, one of my roommates and I got on the topic about economics and Israel came up in it about how he thinks that it's in America's best interest to not to support. And I said to him, how could you say such a thing? And then he said some statement that really is mind boggling. And he says, because they didn't originally have that. And I go, and I said to him, like, why would you? I mean, I don't, I don't know how to say it, because he says that. They originally had it 4,000 Yeah, and I, said, and I said to him, OK. And I, my response to him was, OK, then why are we live in America? We didn't own that land you know, for 400 years. Who in this room is interested in and involved in or intends to be involved in real estate? Raise your hand. What is the oldest deed in the history of the world? The oldest deed. No. The oldest, the oldest deed for property. Location. What is the oldest deed for property in the world? When Abraham bought in Hebron. That's it. And he paid gold shekels. Silver and gold. And in exchange, he got a deed to the property. And that was 4,000 years ago. So when they say we don't belong, we belong. They don't want us to be there. That's their problem. We're there. We're not leaving. It's just, I think, I mean, I can go along with that. I think the biggest problem is some people, and I think it's even concerning to me that there's students at this very university that even think this. They are seem to believe that the person with the most money is the most powerful and most important person. And then their, their, their response to when I said Israel thing is, you know, the Arabs have more money. We should support them because they might destroy us when Israel has no power to do so. And, and what, what we need to understand, and this is not a generational issue. This, this, is, a, this is an American issue. What we need to understand is that Israel is a canary in the coal mine. And they are an early warning system to threats affecting Western democracy. The threat to Western democracy coming from Islamic fundamentalism is the core threat to our way of life. Why? And let me be very clear. There are a billion, 400 million Muslims in the world. Approximately 10 to 15 percent of them are Islamists, are fundamentalists. That's about 140 million to 210 million people. That means a billion, 200 to a billion, 300 million people don't believe this. But it only took 21 people to blow up the World Trade Center and kill 3,000 innocent people. So you have to be concerned about 150 million to 240 million people who believe this. The issue is values. We believe, I mean, when you read the Declaration of Independence and the preamble to it, it says we were endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. Rights. Among them the right to life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Now, we've been struggling for 250 years to figure out what that means. We fought a civil war to include blacks. We fought the whole struggle for women's suffrage to include women. And you're fighting that again now. And we're fighting it again now. But here in America, we fought that war. And we're still not there. We still don't have equal rights for all. But we're struggling and trying. In the same breath, the cornerstone of our way of life is based on God-given rights, not rights from a government, but rights from a God. 
who created and made it possible for us to enjoy life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. And the purpose of government is to secure and protect <coughs> our rights and to defend the people. Very simple. The Quran. In the belief of an Islamic fundamentalist, the last great prophet was Muhammad. Muhammad revealed the last <coughs> truth of Allah in the Quran. In the Quran, you have the pathway to a beautiful life. It requires of every true believer total submission to the will of Allah as revealed through his last prophet Muhammad in the Quran in all aspects of your life. Now you want to talk to that person about women's rights, gay rights, women's right to vote, women's right to drive a car, women's right to go to work. You're talking to the wrong people. They don't hear. That's the enemy that the Taliban, that Al-Qaeda, that the fundamentalist Islamists are against. Because you bring that value system into their country and you destroy submission in all aspects of your life to the Quran. And that's the struggle we're in. It's a global struggle. And we don't understand it. Your friend doesn't understand it. It has nothing to do with who's rich, who's poor. It has nothing to do with who's got money and who doesn't. It has to do with values that underpin the nature of society. What kind of world do you want to live in? Yes, sir. Well, how do you see everyone holding in the next few months with Iran before the presidential election? Everybody hear that question? Yeah. I have to be very straightforward with you and tell you up front. <coughs> I have no additional information to what you read in the newspaper. At one time, I had access to classified material. So I know what I don't know, OK? And it's a huge amount that I don't know. But I have to believe that the Israelis know. And I have to believe that the American Intelligence Service knows. And I have to believe that they're, a, they're disjointed, not because they know different things, but because they have different capabilities and they have different histories. Israel, in the judgment of people I respect who write about it publicly, say the window before they cross the red line where well, you cannot do anything about it except except the fact that they're going to have a nuclear weapon. So about <coughs> six months. The Americans say it's two years. According to people that I know, that I respect, they're both right. The difference is Israel has a window of six months with the equipment they have. America has a window of two years with the equipment they have. And the issue for Israel is, are you willing to cross the six-month barrier when you are no longer capable of doing this by yourself and outsource your national security to the United States of America? That's the question. And when Netanyahu was here and he took the two letters that he had in the desk in his drawer, <coughs> when the, the World Jewish Congress had written, asking the State Department and the President to intervene to bomb Auschwitz, the war was cl clearly determined. And they wrote back in a bureaucratic language, the answer was no. And Netanyahu said clearly for the whole world to hear in front of the APAC conference, we will never be dependent upon others to secure the right of the Jewish people to live. And I say, I'll abide. Do, do you think they'll attack before the presidential election? Because if, no if I knew what I don't know, I would talk about timing. But I would say that when they, before they cross six months, 
whatever that timeline is, whether it's six months or eight months or four months, who knows? I don't know, but I read what I read. My view is, if they're going to act, they have to act before they cross that line. If they need to act, they will act before the November election. I have a daughter and a granddaughter who live in Jerusalem. Yeah, what do you think about that? Like, I'm getting ready to go there for a long period of time, so this is all making me really nervous. You should be there. <laughs> <laughs> now let me just be very honest with you again. I, I, I would hesitate, and I will not hesitate, to go to Israel at any time between now and the election. But I have real concern about my daughter and my granddaughter being there. And uh, they were over here because my wife of 57 years passed away on January 1st. And they're here, and they were planning to go back in the middle of February, and I encouraged them to stay. And I'm not eager for them to go back, and I don't know anything. I'm, be, I'm being very honest with you and say I, I don't know. My kishkis tell me something's going to happen. I trust my kishkis. And uh, if it does happen, in the aftermath, whatever that is, I would send them there. And they would want to go back. And as I said, in the interim, I would go. But I'm 79 years old. That's a different equation than a five-year-old. So I can't help you with any comfort. Dava. <laughs> how, do you, how, how well do you think our administration in the United States has been working with Israel uh, in comparison to the previous <coughs> administrations that you've worked with? Well, let me put it two ways. There's, there are three levels. <coughs> Military level. Very, very good. When I say very good, I mean strategic cooperation has maintained itself. Financial aid has been sustained. That the kind of equipment that Israel requires is being provided, generally. There are some buster bombs and there was some uh, refueling capability that they refused unless Israel would commit not to. And Israel said, no, we're not making any commitments, and they didn't get it. So they went someplace else and figured out how to do it themselves. Uh, Politically, I think they've been a disaster mm -hmm. because they have sent all the wrong signals. I mean, again, I don't want to portray myself as knowing more than I know. I just have had a lot of experience in the Middle East. I've spent a lot of time there, and I was involved with the Camp David peace process, the Madrid peace process, and I just am very, very uncomfortable with the prospects for peace. And I know from past experience that peace was possible <coughs> when the perception, not necessarily the reality, but the perception in the Arab leadership was that they could not militarily defeat Israel. And that they could not shake America's connection to Israel. That caused Sadat to say, it's enough, I'm going back to make a deal. That caused Jordan to make a deal. And while they never had a deal, they kept Syria quiet since 67. Mm -hmm. And they bombed the Syrian nuclear reactor, and there was not a peep from anybody. So economically, they've been very helpful. Would I say they have been the best that ever was? The answer is no. Are they the worst that ever was? The answer is no. But are they what we need to avoid war? The answer is no. That what needs to be perceived among the Arab world is an ironclad commitment to the security of the state of Israel. And that we will not permit anything to rupture our relationship with 